everyone, once again, thank you for watching Sunridge of Nevada. This is I, once again, Bruce Moffs and LCSW, bringing you up-to-date content regarding mental health issues. Today's, our first song is going to be by none other than one of the greatest writers of all time and one of the greatest rappers of all time and actually one of the greatest musicians of all time, Kendrick Lamar. And the song I'm going to be talking about is called Pride, off the album Dem. Now, before I get into the song, I'm going to, today's is going to be a little bit different. And you're going to see, I'm going to do three more songs after this, and they're all going to kind of flow into each other. That's kind of the idea why I did it this way. And kudos again to my agent, producer, bottle washer, uh, for giving me these songs. They're all great, they're all brilliant, and they all flow really, really nicely. The theme with this song is about pride, hence the name of the title. But... By listening to it, by giving my own clinical breakdown, I want to kind of, guys, give you an idea of how pride affects us as a person, as an individual, how it affects everyone around us. Okay, here we go. First of all, pride is not a new concept. This came around in the year, they think, around the year 16, around 600 from Pope Gregory I. There are seven deadly sins in the Bible, of which pride is one of them. But I'm going to read off the top seven, and here they go. It's pride number one. You have your greed, your lust, your wrath, gluttony, envy, and sloth. Okay, fine. What's interesting is that there's a reason why pride is number one is because scholars felt, as did uh, Christian leaders and religious leaders, that pride was the biggest one of all and the one to be the most frightened of, that it could really hurt you the most in getting close to God and hurting you with sin. For example, the Catholic Church, where this came from, Use this concept in order to help people curb their inclination towards evil before dire consequences and misdeeds could occur. This is coming to me from Wikipedia. And they really focused, the leaders and teachers especially focused on pride, which is thought to be the sin that severs the soul from grace. Severs the soul from grace. And the one that is representative and the very essence of all evil. That's where it came from. Now, in Latin... Okay, when we learn about pride, it, it goes that it's considered, you know, the almost, most, most original and the most serious of the seven deadly sins was the perversion of the facilities that make humans more like God. And, you know, it takes away from, you know, the dignity and holiness of it. So also the thought to be the source of the other capital sins, also known as ubris from the ancient Greek or futility is identified as dangerously corrupt, selflessness, the putting of one's desires in front of others, urges, wants, and whims before the welfare of other people. Okay, again, in even more destructive cases, it is irrationally believing that one is essentially and necessarily better, superior, or more important than others, and failing to acknowledge the importance of others, and excessive admiration of the personal image or self especially forgetting one's own lack of divinity and refusing to acknowledge one's own limits, faults, or wrongs as a human being. You get it. Pride is a biggie. And it tends to take us, so even in the year 600, they kind of realize this is a problem in how we relate to other people. In this case, it's mostly about getting closer to God. But today, even more so, it's about how we relate to other people around us. Now, Pride is an excessive view of oneself without regard for others. Now, the Bible quotes pride a lot. It actually says in Jeremiah, Let night the mighty man boast of his might, but let him who boasts of this, that he understands and knows me. And it's also mentioned in the following, Proverbs, uh, Proverbs again, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, and James. So, even back then, religious leaders understood that having the, the, the feeling of pride put you in a different composition, different awareness of who you want to be. Now, here we go into the song. Now, it's very interesting with Kendrick Lamar, and of all the songs I listened to today, of all four of them, I, had, I was telling this to my uh, producer, I had to listen to them at least between, I'd say, 30 to 40 times each one just to get the understanding of it. Kendrick Lamar, one thing I've learned about him from listening to his songs probably now by hundreds of times, is he is a wordsmith that he takes each word and he uses it as almost as an interplay to bounce off one after the other. And all of these people are great writers, but Kendrick Lamar has a certain uniqueness to him. And it's almost like layers, like a layer cake, that the more you listen to it, the more the layers become unearthed, like almost like digging for gold. you got to go through different layers. 
but each layer, and I have to listen to it to get more insight, in-depth understanding of what I'm listening to. That's how good he is when he's on fire with his lyrics. So, he, And also what he does is he changes voices very well, and I realize what he's doing that is subtly to kind of give different perspectives, like I'm Kendrick this way, I'm Kendrick this way. We're this way, we're this way. So it kind of fluctuates in how he's trying to get his point across. So here we go. This came from the album again, Damn. And it starts off like this. Love's going to get you killed, but but pride's going to be the death of you and you and you and me. And then he goes on to say that three more times. And you and you and you and me and. And notice how he sets it up with the flowery background. You know, love's going to get you killed. Like the background, it, it, it gets you melodically focused. And then what he's saying here is that Love is all-encompassing. You know, we get our hearts broken. We deal with love. I love you. But it's minor compared to pride. Like, I'm in love with this person, and they reject me, and it crushes me. I'm in love, but it doesn't happen. And it affects me. But here's the thing. But pride affects everyone. Love is individual. Pride is global. And it's, I always liken that to like taking a rock and throwing it into a pond and seeing the ripples and what pride has done to people and how it's affected them, both good and bad. And it affects everyone. And then it goes, it wasn't all to share, but there, in another life, I surely was there. It wasn't all to share, but there, I care, I care. Like he's, he's going like, I wasn't there, I care, I care. It wasn't all to share, but there... He's kind of going now back and forth, like, I'm here, I'm not here, I'm here, I'm not here, and then boom, here we go. Hell raising, wheel chasing, new worldly possessions, flesh making, spirit breaking, which one would you lessen? He's going off with the yin and yang. I can have the pride of, like, possessions, cars, clothing, houses, fame, fortune, or do I look at you know, what is really important to me? Spirit breaking, flesh making, which one? Which one do I look at? Where does my pride lead me to? Do I need things to feel good about myself? Or am I happy with who I am and who you are? Very smart how he breaks that up. Because then he follows with the better part, the human heart. Your love. You love them or dissect them. In other words, he's saying like, Ultimately, it's the human heart, the relationships that we have with each other that really defines us and who we are in terms of our own pride as an individual. And he goes, happiness or flashiness? How do you, you know, serve the question? See, in this perfect world, I'd be, I would be perfect world. And he's going like this, because it's surface friends. In the real world, how many do you really have? How many do you really have friends in terms of really people that look out for you that are really, really there for you? And I'm going to share a story with that about friends and looking at that. Um, but that's something that you really, and like, you know, Kendrick's status right now is at such an exalted level. Like he's the new generation, he's the new God, he is the, the grand master of rap and of music in general with Grammys and, and, and nominations for this award, that award. How do you hold it together? You know, how do you keep it together when so many people are looking at you as not just as a person, not as Kendrick, but just, you know, I want to grab onto you, I get a piece of you. And even it's more so for ourselves in our own individual lives, how do we make that work to get that sense of I, ha I know who I am and I'm comfortable with who I am? When he says, like, in a perfect world, and let me tell you something, as you get older, it gets tougher to do so, because I don't love people enough to put my faith in man. I put my faith in these lyrics, hoping I make amends. I understand I am perfect. I probably won't come around. This time I might put you down, meaning you will see me for my strengths and weaknesses, and that's hard to do, and as you get older, first of all, having real friendships and really understanding people gets harder and harder to have. But now what he's saying is, you're going to see me for what I really am, both the good and the bad. And the true greatness of people is to try and squelch the bad and increase the good. But we all have warts. 
We all have failings. We're not perfect. And what he's saying is we're not God. We're people. So he's saying this also is, you know, last time I didn't give a blank. I still feel the same now. My feelings might go numb. You're dealing with cold thumb. Pride. I stopped caring. I got numb. I stopped caring about you as a person. I stopped caring about you as my friend. I stopped caring about you as my coworker. One of the hardest things in getting into middle management where I am now to a certain extent is having to relate to people, having to talk to people, having to listen to people all day long and not get cold, not get numb, and retain that human element. And it's interesting how many times people will say to me, you know, Bruce, I really appreciate that you spoke to me, that you talked to me, that you clarified things with me. When so many people are so dismissive, a cold thumb, you know, my feelings might go numb. I don't care anymore. I'm past caring. That's a dangerous state to be in because when you stop caring, you stop becoming a person that's a person that's able to give back to others. And he explains that very, very well. And he goes, my feelings might go numb, but he goes, I'm willing to give up a leg and arm and show empathy from. Pity parties and functions and you and yours, a perfect world, you probably live another 24. You know, he's saying here also is I'm willing to put up with things and your issues and how you deal or don't deal with life. Again, I'm willing to be there. I'm willing to give up a leg and arm and show empathy. And I get that. Being in a relationship, being married, having children, working with coworkers, I mean, you can pull your hair out. Amazing, I have any hair on my head left after a while. But you have to be able to do that so often in being able to relate to other people and like extend yourself, give of yourself. Not easy to do, trust me. And at his level, it's almost impossible because every action that he does is scrutinized to the ninth degree. And that's a hard, hard thing to do. And I get that. Clinically, very, very difficult. And here's another thing also. I can't take humble just because you're insecure. I can't take humble just because you're insecure. This is something also that happens too as you get older. What he's saying is this is my life now. And if you have issues, you need to fix them. Part of what I do as a therapist, as a clinical social worker, to try and get people the tools to understand, yeah, you do have issues, but now you have to go ahead and fix them because I can't fix them for you. You have to fix them yourself. You got to stop using alcohol. You got to stop using drugs. You got to stop being verbally abusive. You have to work on yourself. And in these songs I'm doing today, other artists talk about that very aspect of it, of looking deep inside yourself. Because life, to a certain extent, becomes a business, and you have to step up. And what he's also kind of hinting is, you got to go get the help that you need. That's what we talk about also, is so many people are ashamed, we're afraid, we're scared, to admit they need help. Trust me, after interviewing and working with thousands of, on thousands of clients, everyone has issues, no one is perfect, but you got just like you go ahead and exercise an arm by weightlifting, or lose weight, or take medication, or put on glasses, it's the same thing with mental health. It's, it's a, you're lucky if you have good mental health, but the only way you get it is by looking to make sure you do get it by talking to people, by finding a good therapist, by finding what works for you, by changing your lifestyle to make yourself happy. It takes a huge effort to get there, and it takes an even harder effort to stay up there. That's what's even so difficult for me. The older I get is I appreciate people that have climbed the spotlight and have longevity because it's so easy to get knocked down and fall down like, like crabs. Like you climb up, they knock you down. You're like everybody else. To stay on top is extremely difficult, and I give Kendrick credit for the run that he's had so far. Um, and I have to be careful how I come across to you. I get that also. What he's trying to say is like anything I do – is seen as, whoa, whoa, whoa. I gotta explain myself, I gotta explain myself. I don't have the time, I don't have the patience, but in a way I'm having to like humble myself, get away from my pride, come down to where you're at and work with you on your level. Not an easy thing to do. Now, and then he goes on this. Maybe I wasn't there, maybe I wasn't there. He says that four times and he goes high, he goes low. What he's doing, he's sucking you in. He has the chorus. Now you're going to listen to the next verse and understand where he's coming from. Maybe I was there, care there. He's bringing you in, bringing you in. 
Now, in a perfect world, I probably wouldn't be insensitive. Cold as December, but I never remember what winter did. That was a lot of commenters wrote about those two lines. That was big. It's a great play on words. Because you don't always realize how you come across. Hence the name of the song, Pride. Don't see it from someone else's eyes. You got to look at it through their eyes. You know, when you're looking at it through someone else's eyes, when I do a lot of clinical therapy, when I do clinical work, people say, how do you relate to people that are minorities? Or someone who might be a homosexual? Or someone who's struggled with, you know, a different, you know, part, different language or a different culture? I put myself in their eyes. How are they feeling with things? How are they experiencing things? What are they going through? When you put it through someone else's eyes, what's it like to live in an inner city? What's it like to have a mom who's mentally ill, a dad who's not home, um, living in a rough gang-infested area? Did I live like that? To a point, but not to, not to everyone else's point. But you have to learn to be open-minded and see it through their eyes, and that's how you get people to relate to you. Now, he goes like this. I know the war, you know, in a perfect world. And again, no one is ever perfect, but you got to make an effort. You got to try. And he goes with this. I know the walls, they can listen. I wish they could talk back. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, very obvious. If they, could, if they could talk, what they would share is amazing, is what people say, how they come across, what do they do? And he goes, sick venom in men and women overcome with pride. A perfect world is never perfect, only filled with lies. Promises are broken and more resentment comes alive. This is what we're going, this is what's going to trip us up. The pride. The pride. I'm better than you. I don't have to talk to you. I don't have to deal with you. I don't have to communicate with you. I don't have to share with you. It's amazing how often I spend my day of my day, my week, my month, my year communicating, explaining things. And people so often are like, why does Bruce do that? Why do you do that clinically? Why do I always go, if I'm ever in a session and my producer's going to start bobbleheading because he sat with me on enough of them, when I would say to somebody after I had finished talking for a while, what do you want to say? What do you have to say? Anything you want to say? Or do you understand what I just said to you? Do you have any questions? Is anything confusing? And I'd go back to that, back to that, back to that. And I'd say halfway through, hey, is there anything you don't understand? There's no such thing as a dumb question. I'd wrap it up. Hey, anything more you want to say? Any other questions you have? To give that person a chance to vent, to get suck out <laughs> as much info as I can from that conversation. How you do it is by communicating, communicating, communicating. People are afraid to communicate. They get nervous. Like, let me just send a text, an email. That's impersonal. I use, believe me, believe me, I text every day. And believe me, I email every day. But there is nothing better than this, guys. Look at me. Look at me. Direct communication is where you got to go to get your point across. No, net will never not be the number one medium in making things happen. Now, then he throws down like this when he says more and resentment comes alive. Oh, but do I know that from my mother's marriage, my parents' marriage? The resentment, the resentment. My dad couldn't give up. My dad couldn't lower himself to really say my family's struggling. I gotta, I gotta move on. That's a frustration therapy, by the way, when you try and tell people like you see what's going on out there. You see what's going on out there, and someone is whew, oblivious in one ear, out the other. But that's such a huge resentment from children to parents, particularly to fathers, is like the resentment. Where are you? What kind of father are you? Why are you not coming around? Why are you not being here for me? And from the wives and the girlfriends that are so frustrated that their man can't pick up the slack the way they need to be doing so. Then he brings on other things as well. He goes, race barriers make inferior of you and I. And, you know, so dead on. Because race blocks us to seeing the true potential in each and every person. And in the end, it lowers us and diminishes us as well. And I've gotten, thank God, I don't, I'm not a racist person. But believe me, I'm not stupid to think that it doesn't exist and people don't hate people because of their skin color and their religion, duh. But when I be around people that have to diminish people or 
Everything is the N-word, where derogatory things about women, where I hate, I hate, I hate, I hate, I hate this race, I hate this culture. You lost me. I'm not interested anymore. I want to get away from you. I don't got time for that. You know, when you start saying them, them, those people, where they live, it, it's such a label that's so all confined and you can't breathe, you're choking. I just want to get away from that. So when he talks about that, it is so true how that thinking just destroys us. And then he goes, I'll take all the religions and put them, in, uh, put them all in one service. Um, you do that, Kendrick, uh, there'll be mass rioting from every organized religion in the world. No one's going to put up with having just one religion. God forbid. All right? But can you imagine if everyone got along religiously? No more religious wars? I mean, the number one reason why we're in wars basically today is religion. You would think it would bring us together, yet it separates us more than ever. And that's the pride. I can't comprehend that you have a different religion than me. Therefore, I need to show you. I need to kill you. I need to slaughter you. I need to burn you. I need to you know, decimate you, annihilate you, exterminate you. Why? Because that religion that's supposed to bring us together, the idea that brought us down, is the pride thing. My religion is better than yours, so therefore, I don't have to humble myself. True understanding of religion is accepting of all and hating of none. And then, it goes on like this. Just to tell him we ain't, you know, blank, but he's been perfect. What would happen is you would see faith in a different way. We are not perfect, but God actually truly is on and, and your, and your definition of what God is. In a sense, you humble yourself to get close to God. Let me just clarify something also about that, that what he said, those words there. I've met people that are obviously not Jewish. I had to humble myself and actually ask myself, am I a good person? Am I a good Jewish person compared to what I saw from people from other religions? Because every religion pumps you up, pumps you up. We're the best, we're the best, we're the best, we're the best. I had to look at myself and say, these people are doing things on a level I could never even get to. So in a sense, they're better than me. And I had to like humble myself and say, you know what, I don't have all the answers. These people are doing things on a remarkable level. They don't have pride. What they have is a sense of servitude and I want to make things better. So the ego was checked at the door. And they go out there to carry that mission. And there are times I've looked at these people and I've gone like, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Because they've, they've gone to a different realm. And that's what I want people to kind of understand and comprehend. And finally, um, he goes, it wasn't all to share, but there. And it wasn't another life. I surely was there. It wasn't all to share, but there. I care, I care. And then finally he shoots down with, maybe I wasn't there, I wasn't there, I wasn't there, maybe I wasn't there. And what I got from that was, I was involved, maybe I wasn't. How much did I give of myself? It's like I'm there, but I'm not there. It's like you can be there physically, but you're not there mentally. Have you checked out? That's another thing also, like you can be in your office, like I'm here every day, I don't know what the problem is. But you're not engaged mentally. You checked out. I'm here at 8, gone by 5, lunch from 12 to 1. I got my mandated two 15-minute breaks, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and you don't exist. One of the things that I like to bring to the table when I'm doing counseling is someone saying to me, like, man, you really give a damn. You know, you're really invested. You're not like just like blah, 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 blah. One of the compliments that my, my agent now has gave me was he said, you know, Bruce, when I met you, you were so different from other therapists, so different from other social workers, like you lit the room up. Like so many times I'd sit in these meetings with these people like, <sighs> nappy time, nothing useful, nothing said, you're bringing it. You're bringing, you know, a certain amount of energy into the room. You're saying things on such a different level, like it's like almost like I'm humbled, I'm, I, I'm humbled myself to listen to you and how you're engaging people. It's real. It's visceral. It's raw. It's not like that cookie cutter stuff like, how's your day today? How's your week doing? I don't care about that stuff. What are you doing with your life? Where are you going? And if you're screwing up, you need to hear it now as a kid so you don't screw up as an adult and ruin the rest of your life and be in and out of jail, prison, bail bondsman, drug court, 
the, the DV court and go nowhere. So I'm going to tell you what you don't want to hear because it's not about my pride, it's not about my ego, and I'm hopeful it's not going to be about yours. What do you bring to the table? And since you're not bringing a whole lot, and I'm telling you this, where do you go from here? So I want to share a couple other things also. The falsetto part, I didn't understand that at first, why he was doing that. I got a better understanding now is that by going back and forth, back and forth in those different voices, to me he's saying there's two Kendricks. There's two of us. There's a Kendrick that's, that cares, that's involved. And the Kendrick's that, like, I'm numb. I check myself out at the door. I don't really care about your problems. I got my own issues to worry about. So the one that's relatable and involved and the other Kendrick that's filled with pride. And, you know, I got to, I got to care. And no, I don't care about you. Thinking of myself. He does this, you know, with, with two, you know, two parters. And it goes so well with the song. He is saying, essentially, we all have a mask like this. You know, who I am, who is Bruce, who's behind the man behind the mask. And that's so common in, in, in counseling when talking to people. Like, they give you the stuff up front, and then when that door is closed and you got the privacy, the mask comes off and the real personality comes out on who you are. You know, it's like, it's like going to synagogue, like, pray, 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 pray. But then you go home and you beat your wife. That happened to my, my mom, unfortunately, a couple of times. You scream at your kids. So you spent three hours in the synagogue and you went home and the same mouth that says, thank you, God, thank you, God, is throwing out F-bombs and curse words. What happened? What happened? That's the pride. That's the pride. That's like you're there, but you're not there. You checked yourself out. And it's amazing because even with therapy, you know, you talk to people and they'll leave these secret lives. Oh, yeah, Bruce, I'm working on this, I'm working on that. And then you change because the lives we present and the one that is in our heart that we have to unlock, that goes back to pride again. Like, I'm not the best husband in the world. I'm not the, oh, I'm sorry, not the best father. I have to change. I have to change. I had a recent incident with one of my sons. He was saying, you know, Dad, a couple of times you were really, really hard on me, and it really, really bothered me. And I thought, man, what's this, this guy's upset about something that happened like five, six years ago? What did I do? I apologized. I said, hey, man, I'm sorry. If I ripped you a new one and you took it the wrong way, it's not like, oh, it's your problem. It's your problem. I said, I only did it because I loved you or I was upset. I lost control. I should have handled it differently. I'm sorry. Check your pride at the door. Check your pride at the door. And I just do this with my kids. I do this with my wife a million times. If I offended you, if I said something that made you harsh. And this is going to be the overriding theme in the, in the next three songs is I can't make an excuse. I didn't have the greatest childhood. My dad had very little insight in how he talked to us. And I carry shrapnel from that that I've given over to my kids and to my marriage. And these writers of these songs, some of them have experienced that kind of trauma, that kind of stress, and it carried over into their own personal life. And you got to learn how to, again, look at yourself, look at yourself. Notice how often in this song, Kendrick's talking about listening and being able to communicate or not. That is what pride really is, is the more you communicate, the more you go from here to here. And it's such a hard thing to do because you get sometimes you get so annoyed with like, why am I bothering? Why do I got to talk to you and explain it again and again and again and again? That's what teaching is. That's what parenting is, is sometimes you have kids that don't get it. You got coworkers that don't get it. You got people around you that don't, and you have to express yourself again and again and again. This is a message for everyone that's watching this video is I want you to understand that communication is so relevant. You can never communicate enough. But it's so we, we, we throw it away so quickly with, I'll just shoot him a text. I'll just throw him an email. It's, it's not personal. So will they or will they not let pride get in their way? And be honest, most people can't listen and go there. They really can't. That's why they get stuck. We have, we have people we've seen for years and haven't moved forward. Why? 
their pride or their inability to look at themselves stops them from going forward. And then not just, you see, and he puts this really nicely when he says like this, he goes, but pride and you and you and you and you and me, they're not just screwing themselves up, they're screwing everybody else up. So this song is about putting things in perspective. And good luck, Kendrick, you know, just stay balanced, stay focused. And let me clarify with a couple of stories about friends, all right, real friends. It's during the Talmud where a guy in his 20s, this is a 38, 38 Jewish books about basically how to live your life. A son says to his father in early 20s, Dad, I got a huge group of friends. We're tight. We all look out for each other. It's all great. Dad says like this, you got one friend, you're incredibly wealthy. You're on the level of a king. You got two true friends, you are richer than the richest person in the world. Of course, the son knows everything. He goes, ah, the dad's an idiot getting old. Dad says, you know what? Take a hefty bag, fill it with newspapers, with rags, go around to all your so-called friends, knock on their door and tell them you have a body in the bag and you need help. Of course, no problem. They'll all say yes. One after the other. Hello, it's not Amazon. It's me. I got a body in here. Can I bury it with you? Can you help me out? Person looks out. Get out. Get away. Go. Disappear. One after the other. Finally, one person does this. Come in. Let's go. Went back to his father and said, you know what? For an old guy, you got some brains. He figured it out. Five fingers. Do this ex example with yourself. Look at the people that you work with, generally at work, okay? Or people that you know, or even go big. Go people that you know, people at work, and in your own family. Go like this. Take five fingers and say to yourself, how many true friends do I really have of all the people that I know? And twice, this happened to me, where I thought I was like friend 1,200 with two different guys. It was guys. I don't have many girlfriends. And the guys went like this. One guy went like this to me. Meaning, that was it. Four. Guy knew everybody in the whole world. He went, went like this. Went like this. Four. Another guy who I thought knew everybody in the world of sports, everybody, his, his other friend said, he really likes you, really looks up to you. I said, no, nah, you're crazy, man, no way. He went like this to me. We went to his, at the time, we went, to, we went to his wife, and she went like this. She said, you, to the other guy, and she said, you, to me. So we think we have hundreds, thousands of friends, don't kid yourself. True, true friends, you're really going to find it getting beyond the a hand. Next one. My only claim to fame was when I went to Atlanta to grad school, I met these two brothers that were 10 years younger than me that were fraternal twins, but they said, I met them at a meeting, and they said, we're, we're musicians. Their names are Evan and Jaron. I said, oh, I'd worked with rock bands back in the day. They said, oh, we have our own band. Long story short, we became friendly. And when I finished grad school, they were still working as musicians. They said, Bruce, we got signed. Got signed, wow, I'm so happy for you. They said, we'd like you to be our manager. I said, Good luck. <laughs> Good luck with everything. I want to stay married. Um, so I wish you the best. Enjoy L.A. It, I'm not going to leave my wife. And they went to L.A. They got managed. I was at Wet n' Wild, for those that live in Las Vegas, who have been in Las Vegas. There used to be a, um, a, a water park on the Strip. Great. I don't know why they ripped it down. And I went there dozens of times with my kids and other kids. I'm sitting in the, sitting, I'm standing in the, I wouldn't sit because all the kids doing pee pee in the pool, but I'm standing in the kiddie pool with my kid and I hear a song 
from an album they released. They made it. They made it. They had two or three songs that were top 20s, had a couple of albums put out. They did some single stuff. They're no longer performing, but they made it. Okay. Conclusion to this story. They came into Vegas to do a show. They didn't know I was living here because I moved from Kansas City to Vegas. And they heard I was here, and they came to my house, and they came for lunch, and they said, look, we're performing tonight at Thomas and Mac. Can you come? Can you please come to the show? My wife and I went. We had backstage passes, and they were the last group to go on for the night. They did, I think, two or three songs. They said, hey, that's it, guys. We're done. And we were standing there on the side of the stage watching them. When they finished that song, their last song, they got mobbed by radio company, you know, radio uh, shows and producers and musicians. Boom, it was like 20, 30 people just kind of mobbed them. They said to me and my wife, come downstairs. We went to the UNLV locker room for basketball. And as we're walking down the stairs, one of the brothers said to me, when we, when the show ended, and it must have been, that they were at the height of their popularity. It was like 10, 12,000 people there. They turned around and said, when we saw your face, we looked at each other and said, Bruce is here and he's our true friend. He's here because he's our friend, not because he wants something from us. And they said to us, to me, when you get famous, it gets weird because you don't know who your friends really are. But seeing you was like so comforting. And they said, can you come with us like maybe on tour? I said again, no. <laughs> I want to stay married. And I said, I wish you guys the best. That's the value. And Kendrick, you're amazing. You do great things with your music. It's amazing to read the comments about you. People look up to you. They see you as such a huge figure in their lives. I can't imagine the stress of that, what you go through. That you can't even, everything that you do is scrutinized to the millionth degree. Continue to stay humble, continue to stay strong, continue to stay balanced, continue to take out making take out, continue to continue to make great music that I have enjoyed myself immensely and for all of you, literally your millions and millions of fans around the world. But stay who you are, stay where you came from, stay with your original crew, stay focused. That's it from here. Guys, thank you.